morning and welcome to St. Patrick's Seminary. My name is uh, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska, and I am the director of sacred music here at St. Patrick's Seminary, and I'm also the director of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. And I'm very, very happy uh, that you're joining us uh, along with Benedict the Sixteenth Institute, who is the co-host for this evening's event. And um, you are meeting the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music during its eighth, ninth, and tenth of 12 graduate level classes this summer. And this week we have on campus 28 singers in an auditioned uh, choral ensemble directed by myself and uh, Professor Christopher Berry, who's somewhere here, he's right there. And um, we've been singing for lauds, mass, vespers every single day this week. And joining us are three students studying organ improvisation with the Archbishop's music director at the cathedral, Dr. Christoph Tietze, and five students studying composition with Dr. Frank LaRocca. Um, we're still running or have just wrapped up classes on history and principles of sacred music, Latin for church musicians, parish sacred music program management, intro to chant, advanced seminars in Gregorian chant, a class forming music educators to teach with the ward method called teaching Gregorian chant to children. And next week we'll wrap up all of our classes with a seminar on chants of the divine office taught by Dr. William Mart, more about him in a moment, and the history of the Roman Rite. And the students here this week come from all over the country and also we, we have one foreigner here, um, uh, but we have other students from other countries as well. And we also have a con healthy contingent of students from here in the Bay Area. And along with our graduate level classes, uh, which we're working eventually to develop into a degree program, are events that are geared toward the general public. Beautiful liturgies with sacred music, concerts of sacred music, public lectures on various topics, and uh, workshops on practical topics like how to read and sing Gregorian chant, how to teach chant to others, and uh, more. So as we wrap up this summer's very busy schedule, I'm very happy to announce that we have a very full fall schedule planned with lots of workshops for the general public. But if you thought that you were gonna get the sneak preview of all those listings tonight, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I do, I can say that those will be out in mid-August. One thing that I am able to announce, however, is our very first conference here of the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music, co-sponsored with the Church Music Association of America, the St. Anne Choir, and Stanford University's uh, School of Music called uh, The Musical Shape of the Liturgy, celebrating the life and work of Dr. William Martz, a real uh, champion and patriarch of, of sacred music in the US. And that will be November 7th through the 9th here at St. Patrick's Seminary. And registration is open. You can find a link for that on our website, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. The general public is invited. We're gonna have beautiful liturgies for three days and uh, Laws, Mass, and Vespers, and we will have nearly 40 scholars joining us from around the country to prevent, uh, present, not prevent, maybe prevent bad music, I don't know, present uh, uh, papers and recitals on various topics related to the concert, or the conference theme. Um, our mission at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music is to serve the servants of the Lord. Surely there is no greater thing we can do on this side of heaven besides offer ourselves to God the Father through the Holy Spirit in union with the sacrifice of Christ, and especially this in the source and summit of our faith in the sacred liturgy. To this liturgy belongs the church's treasury of sacred music, which is the birthright of every Catholic, the sung prayer of Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony, whose very essence is the worship of the Blessed Trinity. Our goal is to form church musicians who love Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church to be true servants of our Lord in the gift of sacred music, to open their hearts to hear the voice of the Lord calling them to this high mission, to form them in the truths and beauty of the Catholic faith, and to give them the practical tools they need to accomplish this with excellence and fidelity. You can join our mission, firstly, by praying for us, secondly, by coming to events, so hopefully you've done the first already, and then you've got the second checked off tonight. And then you can also join our mailing list, which is on our website, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org, and a little pop-up comes up about 10 seconds after you're on our website. You can just enter your email and uh, name. And, um, and with that, I'm very delighted also to introduce 
uh, Maggie Gallagher, who is the executive director of the Benedict XVI Institute, who would like to say a few words before we begin tonight. Well, mostly I just want to say thank you, uh, Jenny, for coming here to St. Patrick's Seminary from the East Coast. It is such a gift, so many amazing things already happening. And you relieve a burden of guilt because when the Archbishop founded the Benedict XVI Institute, he had a vision that it would provide practical resources for more beautiful and reverent liturgy. And for a variety of reasons, including I do not have Jennifer Donaldson Nuitska uh, skill set, uh, we could not make it happen. And wow, what a whirlwind of activity. It's just an honor to be here at the start of a great renaissance. I want to get out of the way so that you can meet the uh, creators who came to uh, study with and celebrate with um, Frank LaRocca, who is the Benedict XVI Institute's composer in residence. And I am going to have to excuse myself because somebody has to let the pizza guy in. So we'll enjoy talking to you at the reception afterwards. Thank you. So our topic tonight, building a vibrant Catholic arts culture. And I have beside me many wonderful uh, composers and an archbishop who maybe, I don't know, composed something in this uh, little bit of free time, if you have that. I don't know if you have that. Um, but um, I would like to invite each of them actually to come to the podium. The other things, I'll pass the microphone to you. But if you could come to the podium, just say your name and introduce yourself a little bit to us. Um, and perhaps um, say, besides where you're from, what are some of the most interesting things that you've worked on recently as a composer um, and why they were interesting to you? So I'm going to start with uh, Nicholas Lemmy. It's not necessary. Thank you. Um, I'm Nicholas Lemmy from Nicholas Lemmy from Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I teach at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary uh, in just outside of Lincoln uh, for the Fraternity of St. Peter. And I also have a little parish choir that I direct to of, of men. Um, and my compositional work is much uh, to do with those institutions now, but I do try to branch out and write for uh, uh, other, other ensembles when I get the chance. And um, I guess the, a recent thing that uh, has come up uh, that I've started working on is a continuation of a number of uh, offertory verses uh, in the traditional uh, Gregorian chants, even before the 62 liturgy. Uh, the offertory has several melismatic verses, very florid verses that are not in the Liber Usualis, which is the typical book of the, of the propers of the Mass, but uh, that, uh, that are sometimes sung. But my idea, I guess, was to start composing these for scholars to sing so that they can be sung in response, as the offertory often is sung in response. Uh, so, if you think of a, the body of the text and the verse, then uh, part of the body of the text. If you've been to Tenebrae, you've heard responsories uh, sung. Uh, those are responsories between the antiphons and the psalmody. You have those very beautiful responsories. So, uh, and I just love the idea of wedding uh, Gregorian chant with uh, poly polyphony when, when uh, and with a modern t uh, use of tonality that um, modern in the sense that uh, it's, uh, I guess, not completely atonal, uh, or not at all atonal, but uh, more modal in its sound. So that's one thing I've been working on, and uh, we'll be working on that for a cathedral here in the United States. Uh, hopefully it'll be done in Oc October. So thank you. Hi, 
I'm Jeffrey Quick. I, uh, there you go, that's a little better, yes. <laughs> We're not as, uh, not all as tall as uh, Nick is. I am a composer by training. I have a undergraduate degree from University of Michigan in music history and a master's degree from Cleveland State in composition. And I was writing and singing Catholic church music long before I became convinced of the truth of the Catholic faith. In fact, I think music is one of the things that really brought me into the faith. I am the uh, music director for the Latin Mass at um, St. Sebastian in Acton, Ohio. And we have a nice small scola who does simple counterpoint and a lot of chant and definitely um, punches above their weight musically. Right now, I am working on kind of a strange little project. It's a setting of the Lamentations of Jeremiah for the Tenebrae service. And I had always wanted to do this. And I thought, well, you know, the way the world is, before I die, some city is probably going to get nuked and I'm going to feel like I have to write this piece. And then I realized there's a new Israel and there's a Jerusalem in the new Israel and that Jerusalem is not doing really well right now. And so this is kind of a piece of uh, psychotherapy for me, I guess, in terms of you know dealing with some of the problems in the church. So it's very straightforward in some ways and less straightforward than others. I'm trying to keep it more simple, but it's not really. Um, and I brought some copies for anybody who wants to sing it sometime before we all leave. So that's an open uh, opportunity if anybody wants to volunteer for a reading session. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aidan Voss. I am a composer from the LA area, currently studying at UCLA with Richard Daniel Poor. Um, I was a composer fellow at the LA Philharmonic for about three years, and recently I was in a composition program with Sir James Macmillan, co-sponsored by Benedict XVI, um, which was a phenomenal experience. Um, so yeah, recent projects I've been working on. I just finished up a setting, uh, sorry, a women's choir setting of the Allegri Miserere, so excited about that and have some projects on the works regarding parameter-based music and also um, yeah, moment-based moment music. So super excited about that. And thanks for having me here. Hi, everyone. I'm Diana Corliss. I am the Director of Music and Liturgy Coordinator at St. Mark in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, which is a suburb of Denver. Um, I am so thrilled to be here. I'm the, new, the newer composer on the panel, I think. Um, but I have been recently um, very committed to writing music that brings about um, a greater depth of contemplation during the Eucharist. Um, I've been feeling very convicted about helping people enter into um, deeper levels of prayer and have access to um, the angelic kingdom when they're um, praying after receiving communion. And no small task, but it's something that I feel it comes to me pretty regularly, and I'm blessed to have a really beautiful choir of a choir comprised of section leaders and volunteers and the more the bar is raised, the better they become, which is really exciting. Um, there's 22 of them in that group, and then I have a chamber choir with eight singers. And so when I compose, I just imagine their beautiful voices singing, and so I'm very lucky in that way. And so I'm just excited to be learning from Dr. LaRocca and um, excited to hear some of my music with real human voices and not on MIDI. So I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Chris Miller. I'm the music director at a Dominican parish, St. Louis Bertrand in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I've been Catholic music director for about 25 years and writing sacred music for the choirs that I work with pretty much all of that time. Um, Duke Ellington is kind of a hero of mine. I studied jazz composition when I was in college. And in fact, my career plan was to work as a jazz musician until my late 50s and then fall into a church job to atone for my sins. You know, kind of, <laughs> it, it, I, was, it, I called it the prodigal son career plan. Um, but uh, in my mid-20s, God plopped me into a church job. He said, let me just keep you out of trouble. We'll skip that whole dissipation thing, put you in a church now. And I think, I think it worked out for the best. Um, recent composition projects, uh, there are two uh, that are interrelated. One is that through the gentleman to my left, I had the extraordinary opportunity to compose a quite substantial mass setting for the West Coast Walk for Life this past January. Um, it was a 10 movement mass. There were congregational elements that were based on chant. There were freely composed um, motets for full choir. Um, there was a children's choir that sang several movements um, and, uh, and a couple of chant-based two-voice things. I took a Gregorian chant gradual and tried to turn it into Paratan, and I took a Gregorian chant Alleluia and tried to turn it into the Sacred Harp. Uh, it, was a, it was a chance to try to do a lot of different stylistic things all while keeping them um, appropriate for the Holy Mass and to enable people to worship with a lot of different colors um, but with a single intent through the whole work. Um, and while I was writing that piece, uh, I was teaching in Poland last summer, and I started writing the piece while I was over there. And at some point, uh, I took a break from writing that commission because the idea for a little Ave Maria popped into my head. Um, oddly enough, it popped into my head when I was at a mass, and the preacher was giving a homily in Polish, and uh, I don't speak Polish, but I trusted that the guy had something good to say. And then this Ave Maria kind of came to me while he was preaching. And uh, so then I took out my staff notebook and started writing stuff down. And that ended up being the Ave Maria that we sang earlier this week at one of the masses here at this conference. Um, so the, the beautiful, large commission uh, also led to this small moment of Marian devotion, and I found both of those pieces, uh, I think that they're both successful compositions, and the process of writing them both was also very satisfying. And the people that have sung them um, have been complimentary. And if you've ever written something and you give it to people to sing, and they're good singers, it's kind of like if you make a meal and then you give it to a room full of chefs. And so the chefs all know how to make good food and they all see everything that you're doing. And uh, if you're a cook and a chef compliments you, then you feel like you've done something right. And writing these pieces and having them sung by very capable people who provide positive feedback is very encouraging. Um, and like I said, I've been writing music for a long time, and I'm glad that that experience enables people to pray and doesn't make them wish that they were doing something else. <laughs> Height adjustment. Uh, my name is Frank LaRocca. I am the composer in residence for the Benedict XVI Institute for Sacred Music and Liturgy. I serve at the pleasure of Archbishop Cordelione, which has been one of the great, great experiences of my life. The Archbishop is an exceptionally literate 
uh, man when it comes to music, um, and of course when it comes to liturgy. And he has conceived of some of the most interesting projects imaginable for me to complete uh, for the Institute. Um, I won't go through all of them, but there have been one, two, three, four. There have been five masses so far, and then there, there will be another one uh, in the works soon. But the first project that he asked me to do, which uh, became the Mass of the Americas, um, at the time um, stretched uh, the boundaries of what I thought I was capable of. Um, he had a vision of a mass that would symbolically, in music, uh, unite the, um, the cultures of um, south of the border and north of the border um, in, uh, in, this, in the Western Hemisphere, as symbolized by Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And so I still remember when we first got together to talk about um, how, how to approach this. He said, well, you know, of course, you, you're, you should probably think about uh, trying to incorporate Las Mañanitas. And I said, well, okay, if I knew what that was, um, I, I'd, I would be very happy to give that a go. He said, oh, well, and then, then he explained it to me. He said, but s certainly, you, you know, La Guadalupana. I said, well, maybe I do. I'm, I'm not sure. Could you, s <laughs> can, can you sing a little bit of it for me? Um, the idea was not, and, and, and what, it, what it's, the, the central issue that it centered around is what has come to be called enculturation. This is addressed in the documents of Vatican II, where it is said, you know, certainly the music uh, particular to individual cultures around the world should be admitted to the mass, provided that they otherwise, in, the, in their execution and character, um, conform to the, the three criteria that uh, Pope Pius X laid out in um, Trale Selogitudini, which is beauty, holiness, and universality. So Las Mañanitas and La Guadalupana, they were already beautiful as, um, as examples of folk music. My challenge was to bring them into conversation with the great historical corpus of Catholic sacred music in a way that showed respect for the source materials, but also didn't overlook uh, the distinctive characteristics of those, of those musics. Somehow I managed to do it, I think. Um, reactions to Mass of the Americas has been, um, have been very good. I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that <clears throat> There is a graduate choral conducting student at a very fine school of music in Florida, the Frost School of Music. He is a first generation Mexican American, uh, raised Catholic in San Antonio, Texas. Somehow he heard Mass of the Americas as he was thinking about what kind of project he would do for his doctoral uh, lecture recital. He heard Mass of the Americas. He immediately wrote me an email. I've, I've heard this reaction from um, other Mexican Americans where there is some immediate and deep connection that they feel with the piece because they recognize tunes that their grandmothers sang to them when they were children. And between the power of sacred music, the power of liturgy, the power of the truth, truths of the Catholic Church and this music, um, he's, he was just completely taken with it. He, he has spent the last week on a research outing 
to Mexico, researching some of the sources of the music that I use in Mass of the Americas or adapt in Mass of the Americas, but also researching one feature of it that was my original uh, contribution to the um, Archbishop's conception, which was to um, also use the Nahuatl language because that was the language in which Our Lady addressed St. Juan Diego uh, when uh, during her apparitions. I set a Nahuatl translation of the Ave Maria um, and gave it a little bit of indigenous flavor through the judicious use of marimba and, and other elements. And so he was in Mexico researching um, some of the sources that I used, and he sent me a photo of the very first edition of this small catechism composed by a priest of mixed ancestry in 1634, Don uh, Alba de Bart Bartolome de Alba, in which he provided for the Mexica who were undergoing at that time uh, conversions on a mass scale in their own language, the truths of the faith and the most common prayers so that it wasn't just this thing brought over from Europe, it was something that they could own um, in their own uh, tongue. And he sent me a picture of the very first edition of this book, including the exact page on which I found my Nahuatl translation of the Ave Maria, and it was just absolutely stunning. I am immensely grateful uh, for the privilege of working for the Institute, um, to work so closely with such a holy man as the Archbishop and such a powerhouse as Maggie Gallagher, and to have the opportunity to compose um, for such fine performing forces has really been the dream of a lifetime. So, thank you. Now, I'm grateful for them each having introduced uh, the powerhouse of composer panel we have here, but I would like to go to a man who has emerged as a patron of patrons. <laughs> and um, I would like to start off some more um, pointed questions about how you might get involved in this process, or you might commission things, or you might contribute to this um, sort of culture of uh, sacred music and new composition. So my question for you, Archbishop, and I'll hand you the, the microphone now, um, uh, is why did you want to comp uh, commission a new composition to achieve the things that Frank was talking about and not just use music that already existed from the sacred music treasury? And why should other people consider doing likewise? When I look back on my life, it seems the most significant decisions I make come more intuitively. I don't sit down and do, like explicitly discern something, way this, way that. It just kind of without much thinking about it, it I do it. So th this was something like that. Uh, I had not thought about using the Institute for commissioning new uh, mass settings. But uh, the, the back story to the Mass of the Americas uh, goes back to January of 2018. In the Archdiocese of San Francisco, it's common in other dioceses, we have an archdiocesan-wide celebration for Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's a massive thing that begins at, uh, with an uh, uh, eight-hour procession starting at six in the morning at, at a parish south in San Francisco. Some 30,000 people are involved in this procession at some point or another. They have the vaqueros on horseback and the mariachi singing, the Aztec dancers and so forth. They arrive at the cathedral at two o'clock and then we have the mass is jam crowded. It's that mass and the mass before the walk for life, they vie for the largest mass in the archdiocese every year. So uh, I was looking at the calendar for the year to see what was coming up throughout the year and I noticed we do this uh, the, the Saturday before the feast day. That year I noticed that would be December 8th. 
I thought, well, um, that's one of the holy days that made the cut when it lands on a Saturday, you know? So, <laughs> so it'll be a holy day of obligation for us, and people will be going to church, hopefully. And, uh, but we're going to be having all of these celebrations for Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I thought, we, I have to find a way to take advantage of this opportunity to hold up Our Lady as a uniter of God's people. We're all her children. We all love her. Every culture loves Our Lady. And with all the issues of the divisiveness we're uh, dealing with and divisions of the, with the border issues and all this and these cultural conflicts, to hold Our Lady up as the one who unites us. And uh, I, having been a pastor on the Mexican border for four years, I became very familiar with the Guadalupana traditions and it became a part of who I am. And uh, I know how beloved those uh, songs are, especially the, the Himno Guadalupano. And I thought, um, but it is, it's more of a, a folk style song. It's not in the sacred music venue. So I, the idea came to me that, well, maybe we can incorporate this into sacred music. And we were, um, we were connecting with Frank about doing something in, for the Institute. So this idea just came to me to compose a mass of sacred music that incorporates the elements of the popular uh, songs the Mexican people sing for Our Lady of Guadalupe, but in a sacred music context. So, uh, and it, was, it has been very unifying because uh, Guadalupe devotees, um, people who are into Hispanic ministry, social justice advocates, and traditional worshiping, uh, we did later, uh, Frank was able to adapt it to a traditional mass as well. So people like traditional style worship, it kind of it does have this effect of, of uniting everyone. Uh, so uh, Frank mentioned about enculturation, and I gave him this, uh, an example of what I wanted the music to sound like with using the site of, of, of vision. Uh, the mission church architectural style is very popular, as you probably know, in this part of the country. It's secular buildings you know, use it. But if you look at a mission church, this is an example of enculturation. It's a traditional Catholic church. It's laid out that way. But the, uh, well, first of all, the materials they use using the adobe that's present here and the whole architectural style and then the art that developed around it reflects the local culture. So it's, it's, it reflects the local culture of the time, but it's connected to this broader tradition that may, gives it this timeless beauty. So I asked him to do uh, what the Franciscan missionaries did using the architecture with the sight, with the um, sense of sight. I wanted him to do with the sense of sound through sacred music. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to toss this question out to composers. Um, who are or what are groups or people who commission sacred music? Maybe you are one of them. Maybe your parish is one of them. Maybe your Legion of Mary is one of them. Maybe your Knights of Columbus Council is one of them. Maybe any organization you belong to could be a commissioner of new music. And so um, if you are, as an individual patron or a, a, a representative of a group, trying to do a commission, what do you, like, what, what does someone say to you to get you to write some music for them? I'm gonna toss it out this way. Um, Someone over here want to say something? So the question is, what does somebody have how, to say to How does to someone me? get you to work for them? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's easy. They uh, present an idea that, that I would be interested in doing, and then they offer some fee to do it. Great. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss it to some, so anyone who would like to answer this question now. Um, how does, for example, a representative from a parish make the case to the parish council who says, well, we've got plenty of great music. Like, why do we need to spend money on new music? Jeffrey. I think, wait, how why are we? Yep, you're on. Okay. Um, every time somebody commissions something, it's kind of, a solution to a problem. I mean, very few people commission music 
in a very disinterested way to create beauty, okay? They want to get something from this. And for instance, you know, we have this opportunity because uh, uh, we can exalt Our Lady and we're gonna have all these people in here that you know, we, can, we can reach uh, in the Archbishop's name. If, it doesn't have to be a big problem, but I think it's important to analyze it as a problem because the commissioner and the composer need to be really clear about what you're trying to get out of things and what the composer needs to provide, okay? The clearer you can be between those two parties, the more likely the experience is going to turn out really well there was a case I knew about, I was not involved in, but this church wanted, I think, a new song for their patronal piece, a new hymn. And so they commissioned this guy who'd had some experience with sacred music, but you know, he was not like a fully matured composer in terms of career stuff. And he wrote this thing, they, they wanted a hymn, and I, like a hymn concertato. And he wrote this thing, and the hymn sounded like it was taken from the concertato instead of vice versa. And the other problem was, their problem was not that they needed a hymn tune, really, because they had a patronal hymn that they were singing to Faxe. And there's really no better tune than Faxe. So they didn't need a tune. But the words to this were written by their pastor. And it was very solid amateur poetry, but it was amateur poetry. They didn't need to commission this piece. They needed to commission Kathy Sluth or somebody to come up with words. Okay, and so they wrote this thing and they tried using it for a couple of years and it didn't catch on. And you know, that was kind of a bad missed opportunity. So you start out by going to the composer, craft out what you expect versus what the composer expects he can do for you. Hopefully you've done your homework and know that composer's music. And most of us have things up on the web because we have to promote ourselves because nobody else is going to do that. And then you talk about money. Uh, how much is it going to take? Where is that money going to come from? And hopefully you get a pro product at the end of the process that solves your problem, or at least helps the problem. Yeah, great. Very clear. So I'm gonna follow up on what Jeffrey just said. Um, and let's talk about timeline and money. <laughs> Okay, so what are some reasonable expectations for, um, uh, let's say, a parish wants a shorter work, a work maybe two minutes long or three uh, and of, you know, various styles or whatever. Um, how long of a lead time should they give you as a composer? Someone over here? I'd say it really depends on the composer. I don't, I, I, it's, it's hard to assign a very specific timeline, but I'd say if you want to put a number on it for a three minute piece, depending on how backed up the composer's workload is, I'd say about one to two months is acceptable. Great. But yeah, it, it, can, it can change. And I, uh, compo some composers are just absolutely just jam packed full of uh, new commissions to work on. So it really depends on the, on the composer situation. But I'd say a one to two month window is kind of what you can rely on generally. Okay, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about money now. I'll throw this question out to anybody. Um, how, um, how do you charge? Do you charge for the overall commission with an expectation of how long it is? Do you charge per minute of music? Um, what are some ways that, that you typically uh, charge for music? Ah, a good frank question Chris suggests. I don't think you can follow um, the same guidelines for every commission. 
there are instances in which uh, the commission has strong institutional support behind it. Uh, it could be something like a memorial for someone recently deceased, and the and the the family is, you know, well healed. They want something of very high quality, and they're willing to pay for it. Um, or it could be some small parish uh, way up in in the woods in Maine, where they just they don't have a lot of money. They've scraped together as much as they can. I would say that the composer ought to be willing to meet whoever is commissioning them on their own financial ground and work out something reasonable in relation to that. So that, I'm not gonna name numbers, but um, I did a, a commission for the uh, Order of St. John of Jerusalem that was for a their, their biggest single event of the year at the largest Episcopal church in the United States. And they were willing to pay top dollar, so I asked for top dollar and got it. On the other hand, and I'm using the example of the parish in Maine, I'm actually in discussion with a small parish in Maine that's uh, celebrating some kind of really landmark anniversary. I forget if it's the 100th anniversary, 150th anniversary. And they want, they want a hymn, but they, they keep on saying, we want an anthem that's our own, that's about us and our church and the history of the church and, and its particular uh, spirituality. So, I'll, I, would, I will probably wind up doing that piece for them for maybe about uh, half of what I did for the uh, Order of St. John because they just don't have such, such deep pockets and yet that, that the project itself really resonates with my heart. I, I want to do this. This sounds like a wonderful thing for them to have and I'm honored to have been asked to do it. So I, I think it, you have to... Um, you have to be flexible. You have to meet your commissioner on their own financial ground. And you also have to have some realistic assessment of your own value as a composer. When you're younger and just, I mean, I, I read some guidelines somewhere. I don't know if it was the American Music Center or National Endowment, whatever. But they did give some, some broad guidelines. You know, if, if you're a younger composer just kind of emerging and starting out to make a name for yourself. For a, an unaccompanied choral piece, you might charge $500 a minute. If you're, I can, if you're James McMillan, I, I actually have no idea what kind of rates Sir James uh, charges, but I'm giving him as an example of one of, of, one of the most distinguished living composers we have, um, I'll bet that he gets probably six times that a minute because of who he is and because of his reputation and because of all that the people commissioning it from him will be able to do by being able to say, this is a brand new work by Sir James McMillan. Okay. So, you have to figure out where do you fall in between, uh, are you just emerging or are you an absolutely hot in demand at the top of your game, professional recognized on a national or world basis? That's how you set your fees. Great. So maybe someone who hasn't gone yet, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what sort of editorial control should someone who commissions you expect to have? Is it total control? <laughs> is it a lot of back and forth? Is it um, maybe they have done their homework, as Jeffrey suggested, and really gotten to know your style? But, um, you know, maybe at some point you reach a sort of artistic disagreement. What, what's the give and take look like in that process?
Well, I, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the first question you had, is why we write music, or why we should have new music in the, for the liturgy and just in the world, period. And I've thought about that too because uh, it's hard to do music with my own choirs when there's thousands of pieces that we could do of much better composers <laughs> than, and more seasoned composers than myself. And I think there's two, two reasons I come up with, and I'll answer your question, your other question, but two reasons I've come up with are, one is, is that modern man, while he uses the, the attributes of, the universal attributes of beauty, um, you know, goodness of form, clarity, and uh, order and proportion, he still does this in a unique, in a unique way that speaks of a certain kind of dialect, musical dialect to modern man. And so we, as living composers, have, we have everything else that everybody of our peers that are listening to music of our time. And so that hopefully, the good parts of what's being produced in the world enter our ears and, you know, we are what we eat and they come out in, uh, in that way and then in return they speak to the listener in that very special way and getting to what Diana said, they can uh, elevate people up to that mystery which is uh, beauty. And that's the end of music really is beauty of, and the end of beauty is contemplation or the end of music is contemplation which is beauty, however you want to think of that. It's God is the end of music. Uh, making. And uh, the second reason is, I was just thinking, if we don't commission new music, then uh, eventually uh, we just don't know what could have been. Uh, uh, I think of Benjamin Britten's um, Ceremony of Carols, if you've ever listened to that piece, and it's just absolutely gorgeous music uh, for children's voices and, and harp. And if the pastor of this small English parish would have never asked him to write that, we would never have had that music probably because he would have probably got busy doing something else. And, and w when, w when you do commission a composer, there's this, I don't know about the other composers, I would gather they have the same feeling, there's this utter fear that comes over you that, oh no, I have to, com I have to make something great and it might not be great. And you just have this fear in the back of your mind that it might not work out uh, as you thought. And so to wrap it into your question is uh, the composer and the commissioner have to have that understanding in writing before that begins. M maybe not in those words, but it has to be, the commissioner has to understand that the composer just doesn't snap his fingers and brilliance comes out. He has to work and agonize over it. And there's definitely a skill in there and hard work and time, but there's also something else that some days, like magic happens and you don't know why, that, that something beautiful came or some kind of germ like Chris, Chris's Ave Maria comes to your mind. But you're hoping and praying that that happens and thanks be to God when it does. Uh, and so if that's communicated in the contract ahead of time, uh, I think I put a little clause in there that says minor revisions are are allowed, but uh, you know I think visual artists too could uh, attest to. They could probably have a lot to say about this, you know. So yeah, it's, and it's very important to have the person know your work and have the people that are putting up the money know your work. Uh, so when you write something, and then you too have to be uh, cognizant of who you're writing for, whom you're writing for, and the situation. Uh, you don't want to miss the mark on that, too. So it's kind of our responsibility not to go off too much off the rails, the audience we're writing for. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, so let me play off what you just said a little bit and uh, talk about the terror of the composer. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if know. everybody has that, but I, <laughs> I get that. Not being a composer myself, but um, uh, I can imagine that one of the most terrifying things is actually a completely blank slate and that it's actually the limitations which spark creativity. And a, men, a number of you have said that you are parish music directors. Um, uh, you know, Nick and I are also 
seminary music directors. And so I, you know, I'll just put this out there. There's a need for more seminary music uh, pieces. <laughs> and um, so I wonder if um, maybe you could speak a little bit about how the constrictions um, put on a, a composition by the musical and technical abilities of parish choirs can actually be a spark to creativity to make something happen. Um, sure, I can speak to that. Um, I have been thinking very much about the importance of writing music that bridges the gap. So um, a lot of people I've met, I'm in the Diocese of Colorado Springs, about 10 minutes from the Diocese of Denver, um, and I find that the only solution to not doing polyphony is to do almost nothing, right? There's, there's, it's really banal or it's the highest, and there's just not a lot of um, music that's in the middle, so to speak, um, or maybe it's a hymn arrangement and that creativity stops there. And so I've been seeking to write a lot of music that is for four voices, which already is a stretch for many parishes. Um, but to write music that is for four voices that does touch on that um, celestial prismatic effect. So you still get all those effects of all these glorious things we sang in grad school, all these eight part things that we sang um, that really inspire people to want to get better, to want to do more. Um, it's if the obstacle is too big, some people will never try it. And so by writing in those limitations, I've found like um, that restriction makes me more creative. I have to get this, I have to get this chord to reach that, that height. How do I do that with only four voices? Um, and then also, you know the people who are in your group. So there's also that limitation of, okay, well, I, my tenors don't sing much higher than this, or can one person on a part handle this? And um, not that every piece has to be done that way, but it's, it's the reality of seeing what a parish choir is like in front of you and wanting them to experience that too, not just um, the people who um, get to do special select things like this, but who are in there every day, every weekend, worshiping the Lord and wanting to experience the same thing. Great. Chris, did you also have something you wanted to say about that? Uh, first of all, uh, I... Actually, actually, sorry, can I interrupt for just a moment? Um, the panelists, if you could speak up just a little bit um, uh, into the microphone, thanks. So first of all, to your intermediate music need, uh, for the last many years I've been working with Dominican friars in Poland who have commissioned thousands, literally thousands of pieces of music that do exactly what you're looking for. Uh, and and um, I've been helping translate them from Polish into English. So I. I can, I can give you a lot of resources that will, that will help out with that. Um, the, the question that you posed is exactly how I, anyway, think about composing. That composing is a puzzle. You have a blank piece of paper in front of you, and what do you do? The more limitations that you have, you have to write a piece of music that's appropriate for this particular setting. You have these particular forces. They have these limitations on their ranges or their stamina or their skill as how, how chromatic or how you know, outre you want to write for them. Um, you have a time limit for the piece of music. Um, all those things I find are exactly, as you say, very helpful to um, the creative process because then, there are a whole bunch of things that you can't do. You throw all those options out the window, and then you just have a few things that are left, and you work with those, those elements, those melodic elements, harmonic elements, range elements, tempo, text. Um, you just have what's left, and then it's, uh, for me anyway, it's often very quick work to fashion something that fits the elements that are left when all the things that you can't do in a particular commission are discarded. Right. So, oh, yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, when I write for my own group. Jeffrey, can you point it towards your mouth a little bit okay. and just speak <laughs> up a bit? When I'm writing for my own group, I have found that it's very hard to be easy. And <laughs> the problem <laughs> is that it's very easy to fall into well-worn pathways. And what I have found works is that if there are certain elements of what I do 
that are doable but maybe a little difficult and if I get rid of other difficulties, they work out fairly well. For instance, if I'm going to use harmony that's just a little bit offbeat, I might keep the vocal line very conjunct or the rhythm a little bit simpler. Or if I want to use complex rhythm, maybe I'm going to make the harmony and the melody simpler. You have to have trade-offs Sometimes you'll have more complexity in your organ part um, and keep it out of the voices. But it's what I found does not work is if you write down. You have to write around rather than write down. That's great. So um, did you have something to add, Aiden? Yeah, great. Yeah, so I would just suggest maybe, and this is just my opinion, but that every application of composition has limitations in the sense that somebody, like a composer could be commissioned by the New, the New York Philharmonic. You know, these are the best musicians in the world. And at the end of the day, you still have the limitation of time. You still have a piece that has to end at some point. And in my opinion, at least, composition, the, the trade or art of composition requires an understanding of limitation in every single application. So no matter how deep that limitation goes or how, how many constraints there are, it's just a natural part of the composing process, I think, for everybody. So I think that's something to consider. Yeah. Great. So my wrap-up question, uh, and that is, how can parish music directors support um, what you do? <laughs> how can they spark your creativity? How can they put some food on your table? How can they make sure that you're happy and uh, not burnt out and still willing to work for the church? The first thing they can do is create really excellent music programs, okay? It does not matter what we write if your people can't perform it. And that's really, to my mind, the bottleneck. We have so few excellent choral musical programs in this country. And I salute all of you who work your tails off to get people to sing better, to read better, to um, have better ensemble. And I don't care what you use to do that. If you're using Palestrina, that's great, but I'm hoping you'll find a little time to use my music or Frank's or any of our music but just get people singing. Great. Other thoughts? Um, one of the things that I would also suggest is that you pray with your choirs, that you remind, uh, set and remind um, your choirs what the mission is. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to another parish because I'm, I'm visiting or I'm singing with the choir and it's all the stereotypes of every church choir you've ever seen in your life. You know, like the soprano who you took her seat and, you know, all those things. And everybody is just generally a bit grumpy. And I think, um, I'm sorry, it's true. Am I right? Right? It's true. And that grumpiness, I mean, what, what transcends that grumpiness? What keeps us from burning out? Um, is, and what keeps you from burning out as a parish music director? Because I happen to be a parish music director who commissions my own work without paying myself. <laughs> It's excellent. <laughs> it's an excellent gig. Um, but, <laughs> but I would just say, you know, remind your choir regularly of the purpose, of the intention of why you chose a particular piece, of why you're making music that day in general. And then the more you inspire and stir that flame of the Holy Spirit and stir their love of the Lord, the more they will want to do new things. And then when you present new challenges, um, when you present it to your pastor, even if you have a choir that's on fire, um, you know, for, for worshiping God and for really creating tremendous beauty in whatever capacity they're capable of creating it, then more people are going to be likely to say yes. Great. Other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Last year, the Benedict XVI Institute produced this folio 
which is new sacred music for parish liturgies. It has 14 pieces by living composers, several of whom are, are on this panel. Um, they produced this, they gave it out. You can also go online and download the whole book. Uh, and all these composers gave their pieces to the Institute to be reproduced free of charge, to be sung everywhere. And in the end of the book, is a list of all the composers with their websites so that they can all be contacted. And if you got the book and you sang a piece by Frank or by Jeffrey, and then you liked their music and you wanted more of it, you could go to their website and find more of it, uh, or you could commission something from them. So this is, this is one very concrete resource because there might be people who think, oh, I'd like new music in my Parish, but I don't know any composers. I don't even know who's writing music that's worth doing in a in a modern church choir setting. Well, the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute has an answer to that question with with the folio. So um, anyone who's interested, I would just encourage you to go to benedictinstitute.org/parishmusic. Download the book. It's free. Sing the music. Get in touch with the composers, and then there'll be plenty more where that came from. We're going to sample that and put it on some sort of recording. Thanks, Chris. Sure. <laughs> so we have time for just a few questions. Um, I'm not seeing anything online here, so I have uh, the floor open here. Um, are there any in? Yes, come on up and um, or speak loudly from the back. I'll reiterate your question for those online who can't hear you. Great, so the question about how does a, a piece have legs after the initial performance? Um, and that uh, maybe could be addressed from contractual copyright also, uh, issues, but also um, just the arts culture uh, carrying that piece forward. Anyone have something? Frank. Well, it, it's just one possible answer to that question. Increasingly, um, in order for uh, any given choral organization to um, increase its, um, say, its commissioning firepower, it joins together in consortiums with other choirs so that a given piece is shared among four, five choirs. It, it depends on the uh, choral director, I suppose, who has the initial idea and just um, how far they want to share it. But <clears throat> if the choirs involved are are uh, comfortable with the idea of there being, you know, es essentially staggered through time, five world premieres um, of the newly composed piece. Well, you've multiplied by five the number of, uh, assuming, and, and assuming the, these choirs are not all from the same ge geographical region, they're spread throughout the country, you've multiplied by at least five the number of uh, connections in the networks of, um, uh, of these choirs who can then promote it among their friends and acquaintances and people in their, in their network. That's okay. just that's one idea to get more bang for your buck. Uh, you'll, <laughs> and also, each individu individual choir only has to pay one-sixth of the fee. Hooray. Great. Other thoughts on that? Keeping things alive. I will refrain from singing the Bee Gees. Yes, the co consortium model, I, I agree, is really, really great because the parish budgets sometimes are very uh, low compared to bigger institutions. But... Um, I also would say that 
uh, and I've heard composers put this in contracts that uh, uh, making part of the commissioning fee a good recording, uh, like a clean recording, because what's when the composer, after he's had this work sung, maybe well or maybe not well, maybe there were some hiccups in the performance, which is understandable, but uh, to have the process of giving a nice clean recording without you know, screaming people in the background, uh, uh, my children are part of that uh, <laughs> group, uh, but uh, sometimes, but I, because then when the composer has that recording, it's so important because they're going to be able to show that to other people because it's really hard to just send a piece of music to someone and expect them to read it open score and other choir directors who want to do it. Um, so that's one way I would say. And then I, I'm really just impressed with the choral renaissance that's happening in, it's happening in this country too, but in really Britain. Um, I, it's like groups like Voces 8 and um, those groups weren't, I mean, you could count them on your hands back in the 90s and early 2000s. So those groups are doing just wonderful things of making composers known and getting their work out there and just and making just beautiful choral music known to people that probably wouldn't listen to it maybe normally or would just listen like Morton Lordson would be like the high point of their or the extent of their choral listening. So and these these groups are doing uh, just a wide range of repertoire. So I would say good recordings, good right. ensembles, yeah. Another question from the audience. Yes, please. I'll reiterate for those on, online. Yes, collaboration with uh, non-musical arts. Any projects that have been done uh, that you found interesting? Yeah, sure. I, I've done a number of projects with, with regarding animation and with choreography as well. Actually, um, I was at USC for a brief time and I worked with the USC Kaufman School of Dance and we did a, a choreography project. And I think this all kind of ties back into the limitation question. You know what I mean? Because when you're collaborating with different, media, with different forms of media, there's this kind of cross domain where you have to find, you have to figure out wh how what you do as a musician translates into dance or, or you know, visual art or film or something like that. So it's, and in my opinion, that's kind of, it's almost like a process art approach to things where in the sense that like maybe half of the beauty in the art is the collaboration and the other half is the final product. But it's, that said, it's something that should be definitely pursued more in my opinion and is incredibly valuable for an artistic community that extends beyond just what we have now. Right. Certainly there is a, an interaction between art and architecture in any, yes, exactly. and the, the artwork of all wor artworks, um, the sacred liturgy, the incarnation is the source of that beauty mm -hmm. and the source of the liturgy. Yeah. Great, Archbishop, please. Uh, uh, Maggie isn't here to answer, so I'll speak for her. Um, because it's her brainchild, she's really good at that. But with the Benedict XVI Institute, we now have, a, we have an artist in residence and a poet in residence. So when we have a newly themed mass, we also commission a painting. Uh, Bernadette Carson says she's a local artist in San Francisco, and James Matthew Wilson is our, uh, will write a poem. He, he did the... I was just gonna mention uh, one of the last things I, uh, actually the last thing I just uh, completed was uh, a setting of James Matthew Wilson's uh, poem slash hymn uh, to Ukrainian martyrs. And a, st a stunning and stirring poem um, that I had the privilege of setting to music. So there's collaboration right there within the institute. And we make it a, a spiritual thing because, uh, for example, Frank didn't mention the second, uh, uh, even more bizarre mass I commissioned him to do, which was a requiem mass for the homeless. Um, so we designated patron saints of the homeless, and they each had a, a feast day uh, every month leading up to the mass, which obviously in November. And so Maggie organized a, a Zoom conference around each one where we reflect on the saint and, and have some, some prayer. 
and chanting. Uh, so it's sort of a spiritual preparation for this, um, the, the Mass that we celebrated in November. We can take one more last and final question, just to be redundant, last and final. Any other questions? Go ahead, David. This is a great question to end out. Okay, so every composer has to think of, you know, maybe your top one or two mysteries of the faith that really inspire you. Let's go, starting with Nick. <laughs> I'm not a theologian, uh, but I can speak to, I think, just the mystery of the incarnation and, uh, and then the incarnation of our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament are two things that I kind of will never wrap, well, I'll never wrap my head around them, but uh, uh, those are always kind of in my music, whether the text is about them or not. I guess the text, you could say, maybe is always about them, but, um, but yeah, I think uh, that, I think, I, not to be too verbose here, but I think that, that, those mysteries right there uh, bring music down into from the cosmos and make it a human thing. I think there was a sermon the other day about this. Uh, music's too high uh, for animals and it's too low for angels. It's just for us, uh, for the ratio and the, the, the passionate beings. So, yeah. Great. Aiden. You know, I'm going to... I may pass on this because I, I want to spend some more time thinking about this question. But yeah, that's that was, that was, that was a good thing to throw up in the air. Um, certainly for me, it would be the Eucharist. Um, don't tell my pastor this, but during the Eucharistic prayer is when the most melodic lines start coming to me. And um, I also find that the way I, I read a lot of um, St. Hildegard's writings and the way that she speaks um, about the Holy Spirit and about the movement um, of our spirits and the, like, the activity in our faith. Um, that's very inspiring to me, especially then as it relates to the Eucharist. So I have two thoughts on that. One is uh, throughout the Psalms, we hear all kinds of recapitulations of the idea that the heavens sing the glory of God. And so, you know, earth is fallen and things are broken here, and how close, how much closer can we get to heaven if we try to do what the heavens are doing? The heavens sing the glory of God, so we should try to do that too. And, and with, the, with, with, with music, with creativity and composition, we have the opportunity to do that. And, and something else that I think about a lot is as human beings, made in the image and likeness of God, God creates. Uh, he, he, he created the universe. He created each one of us. He holds the universe in being every moment that it exists. And so our creativity is a reflection of us being made in God's image and likeness. So when we create, when we offer beauty, when we offer beauty that seeks to contain truth and goodness and is not solely about, hey, look at this cool thing that I can do, but it's beauty that's oriented toward something else, then I, at least for me, I feel like that's a part of me being the person that God created me to be, that He is a creative God and He made me and, and all of us as creative people. So composition is is the privileged way for me that I get to express that, or one of the ways that I get to express that reality of being made in God's image. Um, I'm particularly interested in setting proper texts. Um, my feeling is that uh, the church is my librettist, and if they think those particular scriptural texts are important, then maybe they should be important to me too which is not a doctrinal thing, certainly. If there is a doctrine, I've been spending 
more time with a plate. It's uh, the, the whole mystery of the Eucharist. And uh, I've done some things. Actually, my most recent uh, English language piece was basically a, a setting of the uh, uh, Quotius Cumquake text. Um, uh, um, you know, St. Paul's uh, uh, exhortation to, uh, you know, be careful with the Eucharist. And I figure since that's not part of the lectionary of the Novus Ordo, maybe it should be. So now there's an opportunity to get it into services. In my own case, as a revert to the Catholic Church in 2009, I know very clearly what drove me back into the arms of the church. And that was that incredible, intimate space known as the confessional. In my own case, I am motivated by a continuing journey of penance um, and astonished gratitude at the mercy offered us in the forgiveness of our sins. And I, I was, so I would just describe my, my musical journey as one uh, that is a, a place where creativity and grace and a desire to, to do ongoing penance all meet. Archbishop, can you wrap us up with this? Some ideas that inspire you. My ideas are inspired by um, not so much, well, the Eucharist, obviously, because everything is about the Eucharist. All, all of beauty is centered around the Eucharist, these beautiful, glorious, immense churches that are built, these brilliant compositions, all of the art, the poetry. It's all about honoring the Eucharist. So I take, um, my ideas come from uh, how, how does the Eucharist uh, connect with us now, this idea of what, what are, are we facing in our time and place that connects us to the eternal. Uh, so, I, and the Eucharist, uh, as was said earlier, it's, it's also, it's incarnational. So our whole faith is incarnational. So that idea of the phys physical reality mediates the greater transcendental, transcendent spiritual reality beyond it is something that we have to uh, reclaim because it's so central to where as Catholics. And, and both sacred music does that. It has that sacramental quality to connect us. It's relatable because it reflects what's happening now, but it's timeless because it's part of this, this tradition that is, well, there's three qualities of universal, beautiful, and holy. And there's a place for silence as well. Silence also has a certain sacramental quality to it. So we need the balance of the two. I thought I'd just finish with a little silence after what you said. I thought I'd just finish with a little silence after what you just said. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Archbishop. Thank you, all these wonderful composers, for being part of this panel. And in the interest of feeding composers, uh, we should probably head into um, the pizza party, which Maggie has graciously uh, arranged for us all in the library. So. Uh, please join me in thanking each of our panelists this evening and also thank you to you for being here with us.